The state of world affairs from a third floor window. I am watching a girl dressed in a light green sweater, blue shorts, long black stockings. There's a necklace of some sort, but her breasts are small, poor thing. And she watches her nails as her dirty white dog sniffs the grass in erratic circles. A pigeon is there too, circling, half dead with a tick of a brain. And I am upstairs in my underwear, three-day beard, pouring a beer and waiting for something literary or symphonic to happen, but they keep circling, circling, and a thin old man in his last winter rolls by, pushed by a girl in a Catholic school dress. Somewhere there are the Alps, and ships are now crossing the sea. There are piles and piles of H&A bombs enough to blow up 50 worlds and Mars thrown in. But they keep circling. The girl shifts buttocks. And the Hollywood Hills stand there, stand there, full of drunks and insane people and much kissing in automobiles. But it's no good. Chase Sara Sara. Her dirty white dog simply will not shit. And with a last look at her nail, she, with much whirling of buttocks, walks to her downstairs court, trailed by her constipated dog, simply not worried, leaving me looking upon a most unsymphonic pigeon. Well... From the looks of things, relax. The bombs will never go off. Winter comes in a lot of places in August. Winter comes in a lot of places in August, like the railroad yards. When we come over the bridge, hundreds of us, like Hannibal over the mountain, Winter comes in Rome, winter comes in Paris, in Miami, and we come over our silver tracks, carrying our olive lunch pails with a good fat wife's coffee and two bologna sandwiches and all oh, just a tidbit found somewhere to chill our gross man bones and Prove to us that love is not clipped out like a coupon. Here we come, <laughs> hundreds of us, blank-faced and rough. We can take it, goddammit, over our silver tracks, smoking king size in the grapefruit air. Here we come. Bulled, stamping, and cheap cotton. Bad boys all. Aw, oh, hell. We'd rather play the ponies or chance a sunburn at the shore. But we're men. God damn it, men, can't you see? Men coming over our bridge. Taking our roam and our coffee. Bitter. Brave and numb. No charge. This babe in the grandstand with dyed red hair kept leading her breasts against me and talking about Gardena poker parlors. But I blew smoke into her face and told her about a Van Gogh exhibition I'd seen up on the hill and that night when I took her home 
She said Big Red was the best horse she'd ever seen until I stripped down, though I think on the Van Gogh thing they charged 50 cents. All right. A literary romance. I met her somehow through correspondence or poetry or magazines, and she began sending me very sexy poems about rape and lust. And uh, this being mixed in with a minor intellectualism, it confused me somewhat, and I got in my car and drove north through the mountains and valleys and freeways without sleep. Coming off a drunk, just divorced, jobless, aging, tired, wanting mostly to sleep for five or ten years, I finally found a motel in a small sunny town by a dirt road. And I sat there smoking a cigarette thinking, you must really be insane. And then I got out an hour late to meet my date. She was pretty damned old, almost as old as I, not very sexy. And she gave me a very hard, raw apple, which I chewed upon with my remaining teeth. She was dying of some unnamed disease, uh, something like asthma, and she said, I want to tell you a secret, and I said, I know. You are a virgin, 35 years old. And she got out a notebook, 10 or 12 poems, a life work, and I had to read them. And I tried to be kind, but they were very bad. And I took her somewhere, the boxing matches, and she coughed in the smoke and kept looking around and around at all the people and then at the fighters clenching her hands. You never get excited, do you? She asked. But I got pretty excited in the hills that night and Met her three or four more times, helped her with some of her poems, and she rammed her tongue halfway down my throat. But when I left her, she was still a virgin and a very bad poetess. I think that when a woman has kept her legs closed for 35 years, it's too late either for love or for poetry. The Twins He hinted at times that I was a bastard and I told him to listen to Brahms and I told him to learn to paint and drink and not be dominated by women and dollars. But he screamed at me. For Christ's sake, remember your mother. Remember your country. You'll kill us all. I move through my father's house on which he owes $8,000 after 20 years on the same job. And look at his dead shoes, the way his feet curled the leather as if he were planting roses. And he was. And I look at his dead cigarette, his last cigarette in the last bed he slept in that night. And I feel I should remake it, but I can't. For a father is always your master, even when he's gone. I guess these things have happened time and again, but I can't help thinking. To die on a kitchen floor at seven o'clock in the morning while other people are frying eggs is not so rough unless it happens to you. 
I go outside and pick an orange and peel back the bright skin. Things are still living. The grass is growing quite well. The sun sends down its rays circled by a Russian satellite. A dog barks senselessly somewhere. The neighbors peek behind blinds. I am a stranger here and have been, I suppose, somewhat the rogue. And I have no doubt he painted me quite well. The old boy and I fought like mountain lions. And they say he left it all to some woman in Duarte. But I don't give a damn. She can have it. He was my old man, and he died. Inside, I try on a light blue suit, much better than anything I have ever worn. And I flap the arms like a scarecrow in the wind. But it's no good. I can't keep him alive, no matter how much we hated each other. We looked exactly alike. We could have been twins, the old man and I. That's what they said. He had his bulbs on the screen, ready for planting, while I was laying with a whore from Third Street. Very well, grant us this moment, standing before a mirror in my dead father's suit, waiting also to die. Still Bukowski hanging on. Paper says rain. Some asshole backing up and down the street. Pup, plup, 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 plup. What does he want? Well, since we're only using one side of the reels, we'd better get busy and fill him with something besides my chatter over a cigar and a beer. Old, same old malarkey. Well, he's about gone. Mm. <coughs> Hello, Miles. Oh. What a wonderful cigar. Mm. A wonderful stomach. Here we go. Regard me. Regard me in the high level of terror as the one who pulled down the shades when the president stopped to shave, enthralled by the way the Indian turned through darkness and water and sand. Regard me as the one who laughed when the cat caught fire in the radio shack and the owl blew his stinking stack grabbing mice and bulls and ornaments regard me as the one who picked the meat from the bones and shot craps with god as the poison coronets floated the air regard me even as dead more alive than many of the living and regard me as I fumble with flat breasts. Regard me as nothing so we may have peace and forget. Love is a piece of paper torn to bits. All the Beer was poisoned, and the captain went down, and the maid and the cook, and we had nobody to grab sail, and the Northwester ripped the sheets like toenails, and we pitched like crazy, the hull tearing its sides, 
And all the time in the corner, some punk had a drunken slut, my wife, and was pumping away like nothing was happening. And the cat kept looking at me and crawling in the pantry amongst the clanking dishes with flowers and vines painted on them until I couldn't stand it anymore and took the thing and heaved it over the side. Song for Sadists Without a Place to Sit Down Positively grieve no more Ultimo, ultimo, parchivi, par grassi Hold still, bitch, the evergreen leaves Showers of broccoli love Heaving like a rabbit in a wolf's mouth You play my flute, broccoli Pachavi, pachavi, save me Thunder, elephant, moth of everything I sink, sink and stink and saliva Domino, domino, estes, vulgamo, tourist, pissimo, shitimo, ock. I deliver handshakes like bombs in the cellar of the Pope. The Pope is pious. I am not. I wear hobnailed boots up the sides of virgins drinking buttermilk. Please, Popolo, please, Popolo, sesame, drag. The winter chances of nude victory divide the singers from the papal's singular swoop. If eels can climb mountains, men can be eels. If eels can fornicate, men can be eels. Lay sperm like dice in the center of my brain. See what comes out. Walt Whitman staring out the window at the sailors. Or Hart Crane done in and robbed, discussing the bridge with Osh. No, that is not me. Domino, Popolo, Domino. In spring, the heather says swish. In summer, the heather says wish. In autumn, the heather says die. In winter time, she dies. Domino, Pop, I am still here. Yes, uh, that's the one. Yeah, that's the way it should be read. Okay? Sundays kill more men than bombs. Due to weekend conditions. And... Although there's not too much smog, everything's jammed and it's worse than masts down in a storm. And you can't go anywhere, and if you do, they're all staring into glass and waiting for dinner. And no matter how bad it is, not the glass, the dinner. They'll spend more time talking about it than eating it. And that's why my wife got rid of me. I was a bore and didn't know when to smile or fake it. Or rather worse, I did but didn't. And one afternoon with people diving into pools and playing cards and watching carefully shaven comedians in starched white shirts and fine neckties trying to be one of them, kidding about what the world had left them, I pretended a headache and they gave me the young lady's bedroom, she was about 17, and hell, I crawled beneath her sheets and pretended to sleep, but everybody knew I was a cornered fake. But I tried all sorts of tricks. I tried to think of Wild behind his bars, but Wild was dead. I tried to think of him shooting a lion or walking down Paris streets medallioned with his wild buddies, all, all the horse, you know, swooning to their beautiful knees. But all I did was twist within her young sheets and from the headboard 
shaking in my nervous storm, several trinkets fell upon me. Elephants, glass dogs with seductive stares, a young boy and girl carrying a pail of water, but nothing by Bach or orchestrated by Ormandy, and I finally gave it up. Went into the john and tried to piss. I knew I'd be constipated for a week, and then I walked out. And my wife, a reader of Plato and E. E. Cummings, ran up and said, Ooh, you should have seen Boo Boo at the pool. He turned back flips and side flips off one foot, and it was the funniest thing you've ever seen. I think it was not much later that the man came to our third floor apartment about seven in the morning and handed me a summons for divorce and I went back to bed with her and said don't worry it's all right and she began to cry 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 I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry and I said please stop remember your heart but that morning when she left, about eight o'clock, she looked the same as ever, maybe even better. I didn't even bother to shave. I called in sick and went down to the corner bar. Still with it, Miles. Not as sober as I should be, but <clears throat> no excuses. Uh. A $350 horse and a $100 whore. Don't ever get the idea that I am a poet. You can see me at the racetrack any day half drunk, betting quarters, side wheelers, and straight thoroughs. But let me tell you, there are some women there who go where the money goes. And sometimes when you look at these whores, these $100 whores, you wonder sometimes if nature isn't playing a joke, dealing out so much breast and ass and the way it's all hung together. You look and you look and you look and you can't believe it. There are ordinary women, and then there is something else that wants to make you tear up paintings and break albums of Beethoven across the back of the john. Anyhow, the season was dragging, and the big boys were getting busted. All the non-pros, the producers, the cameramen, the pushers of Mary, the fur salesmen, the owners themselves. And St. Louis was running this day, a side wheeler that broke when he got in close. He ran with his head down and was mean and ugly in 35 to 1. And I put a tin on him, and the driver broke him wide, took him way out by the fence where he'd be alone. Even if he had to travel four times as far. And that's the way he went it, all the way by the outer fence, traveling two miles in one. 
And he won like he was mad as hell, and he wasn't even tired. And the biggest blonde of all, all ass and breast, hardly anything else, <laughs> went to the payoff window with me. And that night I couldn't destroy her, although the springs shot sparks and they pounded on the walls. Later, she sat there in her slip, drinking old granddad, and she said, What's a guy like you doing living in a dump like this? And I said, I'm a poet. And she threw back her beautiful head and laughed. You? You? A poet? I guess you're right, I said. I guess you're right. But still, she looked good to me. She still looked good. And all thanks to an ugly horse who wrote this poem. side only real number five five f i v e five <sighs> lamp on each side me in the middle nice little studio I've got here Okay. <coughs> Sick old man. <laughs> Shot of red eye. I uh, used to hold my social security card up in the air. He told me, but I was so small I couldn't see it, all those big guys around. You mean uh, the place with the big green screen, I asked. Yeah. Well, anyhow, I finally got on the other day picking tomatoes, and Jesus Christ, I couldn't get anywhere. It was too hot, too hot. And I couldn't get anything in my sack. So I laid under the truck in, in the shade, you know, and drank wine. I didn't make a dime. Have a drink, I said. Sure, he, he said. Sure. Two big women came in, and I mean big. And they sat next to us. Shot of red eye, one of them said to the bartender. Likewise, said the other. They pulled their dresses up around their hips and swung their legs. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going mad, I told my friend from the tomato fields. Jesus, he said. Jesus and Mary, I can't believe what I see. It's all there, I said. You a fighter? The one next to me asked. No, I said. What happened to your face? Automobile accident on the... San Berdu Freeway. Some drunk jumped the divider. I was the drunk. 
How old are you, Daddy? Old enough to slice the melon, I said, tapping my cigar ashes into my beer to give me strength. Can you buy a melon? She asked. Have you ever been chased across the Mojave and raped? No, she said. I pulled out my last twenty and, with an old man's virile abandon, ordered four drinks. Both girls smiled and pulled their dresses higher, if possible. Who's your friend? they asked. This is Lord Chesterfield, I told them. Pleased to meet you, they said. Hello, bitches, he answered. We walked through the Third Street Tunnel to a green hotel. The girls had a key. There was one bed and we all got in. I don't know who got who. The next morning, my friend and I were down at the farm labor market on San Pedro Street, holding up and waving our social security cards. They couldn't see his. I was the last one on the truck. A big woman stood up against me. She smelled like port wine. Honey, she asked, whatever happened to your face? Fairgrounds, a dancing bear who didn't. Bullshit, she said. Maybe so, I said, but get your hand out from around my balls. Everybody's looking. When we got to the fields, the sun was really up and the world looked terrible. Creek. bottle, a very miraculous thing just happened. My beer bottle flipped over backwards and landed on its bottom on the floor. And I have set it upon the table to foam down. But the photos were not so lucky today and there is a small slit along the leather of my left shoe. But it's all very simple. We cannot acquire too much. There are laws we know nothing of. All manners of nudges set us to burning or freezing. What sets the blackbird in the cat's mouth is not for us to say or why some men are jailed like pet squirrels while others nuzzle enormous breasts through endless nights. This is the task and the terror and we are not taught why. Still, yes, still it's lucky the bottle landed straight side up and although I have one of wine and one of whiskey this forsooth somehow a good night and perhaps tomorrow my nose will be longer new shoes less rain more poems <sighs> K.
KO. He was easy, fat as a hummingbird, and I had him blowing. I jabbed, crossed, took my time. Everybody was waiting for the main event, drinking beer, and I was thinking how we were going to furnish the house. I need a, I needed a, a workbench and some tools. And then he came over with the right. <clears throat> I'd been looking at the lights, and the next thing I knew, everybody was howling, and I was down on my knees like praying. And when I got up, he was strong and I was weak. Well, I thought, I'll go back to the farm. I was always a poor winner. Seventh race when the angel swung low and burned. I watched the board and the six dropped to nine after a first flash of 18 from a morning line of 12. Two minutes to post and a fat man kept jamming against my back, but I made it. I bet 20 to win and walked out to the deck looking down at the program. Purple and Cerise quarters, Cerise sleeves and cap, brown filly three, Indian red, impetuous by top row. I'd seen them all run, Indian red, top row, all but impetuous. Wasn't a bad little filly, and the people kept walking into me. Although there was no place to go, they were putting them in the gate and the people were walking like ants over spilled sugar. The uh, machine had cranked them up to die and they were blind with it. And now by the seventh race, stinking, sweating, broke, ugly, reamed, there was no way back to the dream. And the Horses came out of the gate, and I looked for my colors. I saw them, and the boy seemed to be riding sideways. <laughs> he had the horse running in, and he was pulling his head back toward the outer rail. Ken, I could tell by the way the horse was striding that he was out of it. The action had all been wrong, and... I walked to the bar while the winners turned into the stretch, and they were making the final calls as I ordered my drink. And I leaned there thinking, I want new places that sweetly cried their walls' voices, where mirrors showed me chance. I was once saddened when an evening became finally a night to sleep away. The bartender said, I hear they're going to send in the seven horse in the next one. I once sang operas and burned candles in a place made holy by nothing but myself. And whatever there was, I never bet mares in the summer, I told him. Then the crowd came on in, complaining, explaining, bragging, thinking of suicide or drunkenness or sex. And I looked around like a man awakening in jail. And whatever there was became that. And I finished my drink and walked away. This is a beer bottle. <laughs> This is a beer bottle reading some poetry. <laughs> Jeez.
Jesus. <coughs> oh God. Get hold of yourself, man. Uh-huh. going out to get the mail. The droll noon where squadrons of worms creep up like strip teasers to be raped by blackbirds. I go outside and all up and down the street the green armies shoot color like an everlasting 4th of July. Yet I too seem to swell inside a kind of unknown bursting, a feeling perhaps that there isn't any enemy anywhere. And I reach down into the box and there is nothing. Not even a letter from the gas company saying they will shut it off again. Not even a short note from my ex-wife bragging upon her present happiness. My hand searches the mailbox in a kind of disbelief long after the mind has given up. There's not even a dead fly down in there. I am a fool, I think. I should have known it works like this. I go inside as all the flowers leap to please me. Anything? The woman asks. Nothing, I answer. What's for breakfast? Oh, <coughs> Ooh, Lord. I knew, uh, damn, I'm all tangled. I'm all tangled. I'm caught in a spider web. Miles, help me. <laughs> Jesus. There, there we go. What happened to the opener? What I was trying to say. There it is. I knew I shouldn't have gotten these three six packs. <coughs> when I went out to get the paper to check on the race results. Damn paper. <laughs> Guy chipped me. It only had the first three races. And then, usually by this time, you know, they give you all nine. So I went out to get a paper. <sighs> Bashful, lovely boy that I am. Beautiful, yeah. Shit. Okay. Let's try the next one. I wanted to overthrow the government, but all I brought down was somebody's wife. Thirty dogs. Twenty men on twenty horses and one fox. And look here, they write. You are a dupe for the state, the church. You are in the ego dream. Read your history. Study the monetary system. Note that the racial war is 23,000 years old. 
Well, I remember 20 years ago, sitting with an old Jewish tailor, his nose in the lamplight like a cannon sighted on the enemy. And there was an Italian pharmacist who lived in an expensive apartment in the best part of town. We plotted to overthrow a tottering dynasty. The tailor sewing buttons upon a vest, the Italian poking a cigar in my eye, lighting me up, a tottering dynasty myself, always drunk as possible, well-read, starving, depressed, but actually a good piece of ass would have solved all my rancor. But I didn't know this. I listened to my Italian and my Jew, and I went out down dark alley smoking borrowed cigarettes and watching the backs of houses come down in flames. But somewhere we missed. We were not men enough, large or small enough. Or we only wanted to talk, or we were bored. So the anarchy fell through, and the Jew died, and the Italian grew angry because I stayed with his wife when he went down to the pharmacy. He did not care to have his personal government overthrown. And she overthrew easy. And I had some guilt. The children were asleep in the other bedroom. But later I won $200 in a crap game and took a bus to New Orleans. And I stood on the corner listening to the music coming from bars. And then I went inside to the bars. And I sat there thinking about the dead Jew. How all he did was sew on buttons and talk. And how he gave way, although he was stronger than any of us. He gave way because his bladder would not go on. And maybe that saved Wall Street and Manhattan and the church and Central Park West and Rome and the Left Bank. But the pharmacist's wife, she was nice. She was tired of bombs under the pillow and kissing the Pope. And she had a very nice figure, very good legs. But I guess she felt as I that the weakness was not government, but man, one at a time. That men were never as strong as their ideas, and that ideas were governments turned into men. And so it began on a couch with a spilled martini, and it ended in the bedroom. Desire, revolution, nonsense ended. And the shades rattled in the wind, rattle like sabers, crack like cannon. And thirty dogs, twenty men on twenty horses, chased one fox across the fields under the sun. And I got out of bed and yawned and scratched my belly and knew that soon, very soon, I would have to get very drunk again. Still Bukowski here, fiddling under lamp light. Thirty five seconds. Failures, one after the other. 
A whole duck pond full of failures. My right arm hurts way up into my shoulder. It's like at the track. You walk up to the bar, your eyes scared out of your head, and you drink it down. Bar, legs, asses, walls, ceiling, program, horse turds. And you know you have only 35 seconds left to live. And all the red mouths want to kiss you. All the dresses want to lift and show you leg. It's like bugles and symphonies everywhere, like war, like war, like war. And the bartender leans across and says, I hear they're going to send in the six in the next race. And you say, fuck you. And he is a white dish towel in your grandmother's house, which is no longer there. And then he says something. And that's how I hurt my arm. True story. They found him walking along the freeway, all red in front. He had taken a rusty tin can and cut off his sexual machinery as if to say, See what you've done to me? You might as well have the rest. And he put part of him in one pocket and part of him in another. And that's how they found him, walking along. They gave him over to the doctors who tried to sew the parts back on. But the parts were quite contented the way they were. I think sometimes of all the good ass turned over to the monsters of the world. Maybe it was his protest against this or his protest against everything. A one-man freedom march that never squeezed in between the concert reviews and the baseball scores. God or somebody bless him. Sour Ghost I'm afraid I have failed the visitation. When the ghost said, duck, I let one go to the body and one to the chin and flattened out there. I found he was an old time baseball player, Rudy Medriac. Lifetime average, 263, a suicide in a Montreal hotel. No money, no luck, no talent, a real dud. Cut. The weather is hot on the back of my watch. The weather is hot on the back of my watch, which is down at Finkelsteins, who is gifted with three balls, but
but no heart. But you've got to understand when the bull goes down or the horror, the heart is laid aside for something else. And let's not overrate an obvious decency. For even in a crap game, you may be cutting down some wobbly king of six kids and a hemorrhoid butt on his last unemployment check. And who is to say the rose is greater than the thorn? Not I, Henry. And when your love gets flabby knees and prefers flat shoes, maybe you should have stuck it into something else, like an oil well or a herd of cow. I'm too old to argue. I've gone with the poem and been KO'd with the old sucker punch. Round after round. But sometimes I like to think of the Kaiser or any fool full of metals and nothing else. Or the first time we read Das or Elliot with his trousers rolled. The weather is hot on the back of my watch, which is down at Finkelstein's. But you know what they say, things are tough all over. And I remember once on the bum in Texas, I watched a crow blast. 100 farmers with 100 shotguns jerking off the sky with a giant penis of hate and the crows came down half dead half living and they clubbed them to death to save their shells but they ran out of shells before they ran out of crows and the crows came back and walked around the pellets and stuck out their tongues and mourned their dead and elected new leaders and then all at once flew home to fuck to fill the gap. You can only kill what shouldn't be there. And Finkelstein should be there and my watch and maybe myself. And I realized that if the poems are bad, they are supposed to be bad. And if they are good, they are likewise supposed to be, although there is a minor arc of fighting to be done. But still I am sad because I was in this small town somewhere in the Badlands, way off course, not even wanting to be there. Two dollars in my wallet, and a farmer turned to me and asked me what time it was, and I wouldn't tell him. And later, they gathered them up for burning, though they were no worse than dung with feathers, feathers and a little gasoline, and from the bottom of one pile, a nut quite dead crow smiled at me. It was 4.35 p.m. I'm going to throw in the next poem that probably can't be used because uh, generally speaking I'm an uneducated man. What I mean by that is uh, though I've read perhaps a great deal or maybe too much or not enough that I am a man alone if not of the crowd and I do not hear people speaking words back to each other and I do not know correct 
pronunciations. So, with this, it'll be pretty badly fucked up. So, understand the circumstances, but still understand that I should still be allowed to be a man to write a poem like this upon paper, even though perhaps I should not be allowed to speak it out loud. My ignorance, ignorance is only technical. Let's hope. Or the beer-filled dream is dead forever. All right. John Dillinger and Le Chasseur Made. It's unfortunate and simply not the style, but I don't care. Girls remind me of hair in the sink. Girls remind me of intestines and bladders and excretory movements. It's un it is, it is unfortunate, yes. And also unfortunate that ice cream bells, babies, engine valves, plagio stones, palm trees, footsteps all in the hall, all these things all excite me with the cold calmness of the gravestone. Nowhere, perhaps, is there sanctuary except in hearing that there were other desperate men. Dillinger, Rimbaud, Villon, Babyface Nelson, Seneca, Van Gogh, or desperate women, lady wrestlers, nurses, waitresses, whores, poetesses, Although, I do suppose the breaking out of ice cubes is important. Or a mouse nosing an empty beer can, the two hollow emptinesses. Emptinesses, those two hollow emptinesses looking into each other. Don't you suppose that is important? Or the night sea stuck with soiled ships that enter the charry web of your brain with their lights, with their salty lights that touch and leave you for some more solid love of some India? Or driving great distances without reason, sleep drugged through open windows that tear and flap your shirt like a frightened bird and always the stoplights always red night fire and defeat defeat scorpions scraps fardels ex-jobs ex-wives ex-faces ex-lives beethoven in his grave as dead as a beat Red wheelbarrows, yes, perhaps, or a letter from hell signed by the devil, or two good boys beating the guts out of each other in some cheap stadium full of screaming smoke. But mostly, I don't care, sitting here with a mouthful of rotten teeth, Sitting here reading Herrick and Spencer and Marvell and Hopkins and Bronte, Emily today, and listening to Dvorak, Midday Witch, or Franks Les Chaussures, Mande. Actually, I don't care. That's unfortunate. 
I've been getting letters from a young poet, very young it seems, telling me that someday I will most be surely recognized as one of the world's great poets. Poet. A malversation. Today, I walked in the sun and streets of this city, seeing nothing, learning nothing, being nothing. And coming back to my room, I passed an old woman who smiled a horrible smile. She was already dead, and everywhere I remembered wires, telephone wires, electric wires, wires for electric faces, trapped like goldfish in the glass and smiling. And the birds were gone. None of the birds wanted wire or the smiling of wire, and I closed my door at last. But through the windows it was the same. A horn honked. Somebody laughed. A toilet flushed, and oddly then, I thought of all the horses with numbers that have gone by on the screaming, gone by like Socrates, gone by like Lorca, Lorca, like Chatterton, Chatterton. Ah! I'd rather imagine our death will not matter too much except as a matter of disposal, a problem like dumping the garbage. And although I saved the young poet's letters, I do not believe them. But like at the diseased palm trees and the end of the sun, I sometimes look... One for Ging with Clue Top. I live among rats and roaches, but there is this high rise apartment, a new one across from me, glimmering pool, lived in by very young people with new cars, mostly red or white cars, and I allow myself to look upon this scene as some type of miracle world, not because it is possibly so, but because it is easier to think this way. Why take more knives? So today I sat here and I saw one young man sitting in his red car, sucking his thumb and waiting as another young man, obviously his friend, talked to a young woman dressed in a kind of long, slim, short pants, yes. Long, slim, short pants and a, a black, ill-fitting blouse and she had on some kind of high-pointed hat, rather like the Ku Klux Klan wears. And uh, the other young man sucked, sat and sucked his thumb in the red car, and behind them through the glass door, the other young people sat and sat and sat and sat around the blue pool. And the young woman was angry. She was ugly anyhow, and now she was very ugly. But she must have had something to interest the young man, and she said something violent and final, I couldn't hear any of it, and walked off west, away from the young man in the building, and the young man was flushed in the face, seemingly more stunned than angry, and then they both sat in the car for a while, and then the other young man took his thumb out of his mouth, started the red car, and then they were gone. And through my window and through the glass door, I could see the other young people sitting, sitting, sitting around the blue pool. My miracle crowd, my future leaders, 
To make it round out, I decided that the night before, the young man, not the one with the thumb, had tried to screw the ugly girl in the pointed hat while they were both drunk, and the ugly girl in the pointed hat felt, for some reason, that this was a damned dirty trick. Uh... She acted bit parts in Little Theater, was said to have talent, had a fairly wealthy father, and her name was Ging or Gang or something odd like that, and that was mainly why the boys wanted to screw her, because her first name was Gig or Gang or Azupu, and the boys wanted to say, very much wanted to say, I balled with Ging last night. All right... So having settled all that, I put on some coffee and rolled myself something calming. A train ride in hell. Go, 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 they yell. And a monkey reaches up and twists out the light. And the old redhead in the black dress lifts her skirts and dances. Go, 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 go. She wiggles her well-done hump of a tail. And then the cop comes in through the vestibule and they cheer. Yay, yay. And he moves off with the redhead in front of him. Hair in her eyes, mouth twisted down in disgust. And they scream at him. You take it. Have a nice piece. Yay! It is a train ride in hell. The losers from the racetrack going 100 miles home to jobs and no jobs. Wives and no wives. Lives and no lives. And the jack behind the bar has only beer. It floats in a trash can of ice, and he dumps the hot beer in. Yay, yay, they scream every time a new person enters the bar car. And grabs cans and opens and sells them as fast as the machine will punch holes. Go, 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 go. They found a new one and she dances. The whores get on at San Clemente where they've been sitting in the bars and they ride north to L.A. picking up what they can. And now she's rolling imaginary dice. No, they are real. There are quarters on the floor. She wiggles a dice. She wiggles her can and they scream. Go, 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 go. The cop comes through again and the dice disappear. He is smoking a cigarette and his cap is pushed back. He is gray and looks more drunkard than any of us. Yay, yay, they cheer him and he walks on. An extrovert in a blue sports shirt moves around hugging and kissing the women. Then a colored girl hangs from her knees from a crossbar. Yay! Go! 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 Yay! A homosexual pushes his face in mine. Have you been to the racetrack? I move away from him, walk to the bar, and sweat my weight for a beer. Yay! Go! 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 The colored girl dances opposite a Chinaman. Go, 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 go. I get my beer. Outside, the buildings go by. People looking at television. In Berlin, they fuck with their wall. People ponder issues of state with stones. Here an old blonde presses her flank against mine. I buy her a beer and a pack of Paul Malls. Then she says, Come with me, I have to go to the can. And we walk past the crowd. 
Yay, yay, there they go. Go, 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 go. She is wearing slacks and her belly is out from the top of them and I wait outside the sign that says women. And I am sweating and impatient for the little the beer is doing. And I empty the can and throw it in the vestibule. And I drink hers too. And in the other car, the people are tired and miserable, redreaming their losses, strung out in their seats, stuffed things taken again by the world. And my whore comes out, and we walk again into the bar car. Yay, yay, go, 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 dance, dance, dance. And she begins to dance, wobbling what is left of the masquerade of her flesh, and I leave her and go to the bar. Go, 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 go. There is still beer left. The jack is dragging it out of the closets. The train sways, sways, doing 90, 95, 98. The engineer is a loser, too, popping a keg of beer between his legs. And I think of the battles fought through the centuries, the battles in small rooms on battlefields. Madman, genius, idiot, fake, all drawing blood, all wasted, wasted, wasted. The roaches will crawl everywhere over Schubert's Symphony Number no. 9, in and out of our ears. Go, 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 go. And yet here, this too means something. And my whore is back, and we drink until some crazy jack turns on the fire system, and the lights go out, and we're all under a cold shower. Yay, yay, go, 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 go. Somebody gets the water off and the lights on. And the women all have toad's heads, the hair flat, mascara gone, eyelids gone, and they are giggling. Purses and mirrors out, combs out, trying to hide from life again. And I look away, cool at last, get a couple more beers, find a dry cigarette and light up. And then like another sore, Los Angeles is upon us, and we're out of the doors running down the ramps. Yay! Go, go, go! There is a wheelchair in the aisle, and the extrovert in a blue sports shirt puts his friend in it. Sick man, sick man, gangway, hey gangway, dying man. They move at a very rapid speed, to put it blandly. Hey, gangway, sick man, oh, go, 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 oh, go, 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 yay. A guard stops him and takes the wheelchair, and then my friend in the blue shirt picks his friend up and puts him over his shoulder, and he hurries down the ramp. Hey, hey, gangway, dying man! My whore is still there when I get to my car in the parking lot. She gets in, and we drive off past the city hall and onto the freeway. And there's one more race to be run without a winner. And all around is drive people who've been to the baseball game or the beach or a movie or Aunt Sarah's. And the whore says, That harmats, I just don't know. The kid won't win for me. Twenty minutes later, she is in my room. Go, 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 yay! Outside, it is very still, and you can hear the bombers overhead. You can hear the mice making love. You can hear them digging the graves at the cemeteries. You can hear worms crawling into sockets. And the train we came in on, it sits very still now. It is quiet. The windows show nothing but moonlight. There is a sadness like old rivers, and it is more real than it has ever been.
Ignis Fatus. The only solitude is sleep or death. We were not clever enough. Kind to others and cruel to self. One self asked for mercy and was denied. The holiest privacy remains waiting on us. And all that was misunderstood or abandoned will come together. Let my failure be your fortune. This that was broken in careless error, let it be known that to know your own death is to die twice, once really and then hardly at all. Let it be known that there is nothing as ugly in all its tangents as the human beast, a trick set against the blood of your soul. Let it be known that solitude is the only mercy and the only lover. Let it be known that a man need not be Christ to be crucified. Let it be known that a man can be crucified each day, each moment, each breath, to sleep and awaken and be tormented again. Let it be known that a man can die and die and die and die and still feel the pain and know he is dead and still feel the pain and know there is nothing he can do and still feel the pain. Let it be known. Let it be known that the temples are nothing and the bells are nothing and fame is nothing and victory is nothing and sex is nothing and that solitude brings madness and the crowd brings madness and drinks and eats the body like a tiger that there is no voice to speak with, no ear to hear. Let it be known there will be other men such as I, lifted for the lion's mouth, burned down by false loves, tricked by kindness, missled by intellect, dizzied by posy, sacrifice for profit, used as cheap labor. And these will be the kindest of happenings compared to what will enter the eye and ear and the brain and seep to the innards to begin their death work. I pity all such brothers of mine who will follow me in the centuries unable to love because there is nothing to love, unable to kill because there is nothing alive, forever hanging and bleeding and dizzied by the beast human, the walls, the gardens, the sun, the flowers, the kisses, the flags, the seas, the animals, the food, the liquors, the paintings, the symphonies, all uselessness. Let it be known that most men love when they can see and they see each other and they love this because they see very little. Let it be known that I am bitter and damned and tired and useless. Let it be known when the final hope goes, there remains but a staring at the dance and a watching the feeble intercourse of the idiots with very little note-taking. Let it be known that I am dead, but there is no anger. Let it be known that most men are dead many years before burial. Let it be known that many men die in childhood, that many men are born dead, 
all of their parts move and they make sound and grow and advance into adult behavior and do things of civilization. Let it be known that these men never existed and that their funerals were extreme farce and also the dead tears for the already dead. Let it be known that the worms themselves were nearer to truth and that they did not cry. Let it be known that birth is not holy, that death is not holy, that life is not holy. Let it be known that I have bled without crowns that I will bleed in a moment, that I will bleed forever, red, 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 and the hawks will dance within my bones and rejoice. Let it be known that I do not die for man's sins, but that I die for what man is and for what I almost was. They too little of anything and myself lifted enough to see the horror, to sicken and go mad and wilt. Do not take as personal what I say about life altogether, or men altogether, unless on another plane you consider yourself a defender of life and man which is only another natural weakness of the species, like a rat guarding its nest, on for which I cannot hold you totally to blame. The only solitude is death, but not this death, not this death, not this death. Yellow. Sievers was one of the hardest running backs since Jimmy Brown and lateral motion too, like a chorus girl, really, until one day he got hit on the blind side by Basil Skronsky. We carried Sievers off the field, but Skronsky had gotten one rib and another cracked. The next year, Seavers wasn't even good in practice, gun-shy as a squirrel in deer season. He stopped contact, fumbled, couldn't even hold a look-in pass or a handoff. All that wasted, and he could go the hundred in nine-seven. I'm forty-five years old, out of shape, too much beer but one of the best assistant coaches in the pro game, and I can't stand to see a man jaking it. I can't. I got him in a locker room the other day when the whole squad was in there. I told him, Sievers, you used to be a player, but now you're chicken shit. You can't talk to me that way, Manny, he said. And I turned him around, he was lacing on a shoe, and I right cracked him right on the chin. He fell against a locker, and then he began to cry. The greatest since Brown, crying there against a locker, one shoe off, one on. Come on, man, let's get out of here, I told the gang. And we ran on out. And when we got back, he had cleared out, he was gone, his gear was gone. We got some kid from Illinois running his spot now. Head down, knees high, he don't care where he's going. Guys like Seavers end up washing dishes for a buck an hour. And that's just what they deserve. The Colored Birds. It's a high-rise apartment next door. And he beats her at night and she screams and nobody stops it. And I see her the next day standing in the driveway with huge curlers in her hair. 
and she has her huge buttocks jammed into the same black slacks, and she says, standing in the sun, God damn it, 24 hours a day in this place. I never go anywhere. And then he comes out proud, the little matador, a Jewish pail of shit, his belly hanging all over his bathing trunks. He might have been a handsome man once, might have. Now they both stand there and he says, I think I'm going for a swim. She doesn't answer and he goes inside to the pool and dunks into the fishless, sandless water, the peroxide codeine water. And I stand by the kitchen window drinking coffee, trying to unboil the fuzzy, stinking picture. After all, you can't live elbow to elbow to people without wanting to draw a number on them. Every time my toilet flushes, they can hear it. Every time they go to bed, I can hear them. Well, soon she goes inside and then comes out with two large colored birds in a cage. I don't know what they are. They don't talk. They just move a little, always seeming to twitch their tail feathers and shit. That's all they do. <laughs> she stands there looking at them. He comes out, the little tuna, the little matador out of the pool, a dripping unbeautiful white, the cloth of his wetsuit gripping clearly against his balls. Get those birds in the house. The birds are gonna die. I said, get those birds in the house. But the birds need sun. You listen to me. I said, get those birds in the house. She bends and lifts them. Her huge buttocks in the same black slacks looking so sad. He slams the door. Then I hear it. She screams. She screams again, then, and she screams. I pour another coffee and decide that's a new one. He usually beats her at night. It takes a man to beat his wife night and day. Although he doesn't look like much, he's one of the few real men around here. from the Department of English. 100 million Chinese bugs on the stairway to hell. Come drink with me, rub my back with me. This filth-pitched room, floor covered with yellow newspapers three weeks old. Bottle caps, a red pencil, a rip of toilet paper. These odd bits of broken things. The flies worry me as ice cream ladies walk past my window. At night I sleep, try to sleep between <laughs> mounds of stinking laundry. And ghosts come out to play dirty games, evil games, games of horror with my mind. In the morning, there's blood on the sheet from a broken sore upon my back. Putting on a shirt that rips across my back, rotten rag of a thing, and putting on pants with a rip in the crotch, I find in the mailbox, along with other threats, Dear Mr. Bukowski, would like to see some of your poems for possible inclusion in X Poetry Review. How's it going? The Underground 
place was crowded, the editor told me, Charlie, get some chairs from upstairs. There are more chairs upstairs. I bought them down and we opened the beer and the editor said, uh, we're not getting enough advertising, the boat might go down. So they started talking about how to get advertising. I kept drinking the beer and had to piss and when I got back, the girl next to me said, we ought to evacuate the city, that's what we ought to do. I said, I'd rather listen to Joseph Hyden. She said, just think of it, if everybody left the city, it would only be someplace else stinking it up, I said. I don't think you like people, she said, pulling her short skirt down as much as possible. Just to fuck with, I said. And I went to the bar next door and bought three more six-packs of beer. When I got back, they were talking revolution. So here I was, back in 1935 again. Only I was old and they were young. I was at least 20 years older than anybody in the room. And I thought, what the hell am I doing here? Soon the meeting ended. And they went out into the night, those young ones. And I picked up the phone. I got John T. John, you okay? I'm low tonight. Suppose I come over and get drunk. Sure, Charlie, we'll be waiting. Charlie, said the editor, I guess we got to put the chairs back upstairs. We carried the chairs back upstairs. The revolution was over. Fire Station for Jane B. with Love. We came out of the bar because we were out of money, but we had a couple of wine bottles in the room. It was about four in the afternoon and we passed a fire station and she started to go crazy. A fire station? Oh, I just love fire engines. They're so red and all. Let's go in. I followed her on in. Fire engines, she screamed, wobbling her big ass. She was already trying to climb into one, pulling her skirt up to her waist, trying to jackknife up into the seat. Here, here, let me help you, a fireman ran up. Another fireman walked up to me. Our citizens are always welcome, he told me. The other guy was up in the seat with her. You got one of those big things, she asked him. Oh, ha, ha, I mean, one of those big helmets. I've got a big helmet, too, he told her. Oh, ha, <laughs> ha, You, uh, play cards, I asked my fireman. I had 43 cents and nothing but time. Come on in back, he said. Of course we don't gamble, it's against the rules. I understand, I told him. I had run my 43 cents up to $1.90 when I saw her going upstairs with her fireman. He's gonna show me their sleeping quarters, she told me. I understand, I told her. When her fireman slid down the pole ten minutes later, I nodded him over. That'll be five dollars. Five dollars for that? Uh, we wouldn't want a scandal, would we? We might... 
both lose our jobs. Of course, I'm not working. He gave me the five. Sit down, you might get it back. What's your plan? Blackjack. Gambling's against the law. Anything interesting is, besides, you see any money on the table? He sat down. That made five of us. Uh, how was it, Harry? Somebody asked him. Uh, not bad, not bad. The other guy went on upstairs. They were bad players, really. They didn't bother to memorize the deck. They didn't know whether the high numbers or low numbers were left. And basically, they hit too high, didn't hold low enough. When the other guy came down, he gave me a five. How was it, Marty? Uh, not bad. She's got some... She's got some fine movements. Hit me, I said. Nice clean girl. Uh, I ride it myself. Nobody said anything. Uh, any big fires lately, I asked. Nah, nothing, nothing much. You guys need exercise. Hit me again. A big red-headed kid who'd been shining an engine threw down his rag and went upstairs. When he came down, he threw me a five. When the fourth guy came down, I gave him three fives for a twenty. I don't know how many firemen were in the building or where they were. I figured a few had slipped by me, but I was a good sport. It was getting dark outside when the alarm rang. They started running around. Guys came sliding down the pole. Then she came sliding down the pole. She was good with the pole. A real woman. Nothing but guts and ass. Let's go, I told her. She stood there waving goodbye to the firemen, but they didn't seem much interested anymore. Let's go back to the bar, I told her. Ooh, you got money? I found some I didn't know I had. We sat at the end of the bar with whiskey and beer chaser. I sure got a good sleep. Sure, baby. You need your sleep. Look at that sailor looking at me. He must think I'm a... a... Nah, he don't think that. Relax. You've got class. Real class. Sometimes you might remind me of a... of an opera singer. <laughs> yes, I mean it. You know... One of those prima D's. Your class shows all over you. Drink up. I ordered two more. You know, Daddy. What? Daddy, you're the only man I love. I mean, really love, you know? Sure I know. Sometimes I think I'm a king in spite of myself. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean, something like that. I had to go to the urinal. When I came back, the sailor was sitting in my seat. She had her leg up against his, and he was talking. I walked over and got in a dark game with Harry the Horse and the corner newsboy. Birth. Reading the uh, dialogues of Plato when the doctor walks up and says, 
Do you still read that highbrow stuff? Last time I read that, I was in high school. I read it, I tell him. Well, it's a girl. Nine pounds, three ounces. No trouble at all. Shit, great. When can I see them? They'll let you know. Good night. I sit down to Plato again. There are four people playing cards. One woman has beautiful legs that she doesn't hide, and I keep looking at her legs until she covers them with a blue sweater. I'm called upstairs. They show me the thing through glass. It's red as a boiled crab and tough. It will make it. It will see it through. Hey, look at this, Plato. Another broad. I can see her now on some Sunday afternoon, shaking it in a tight skirt, making boulevards of young men warble in their guts. I wave the girl and the nurse away. The woman is still stunned with drugs, but I tell her, a great woman has arrived and make my fists into little balls and I hold up my arms and snarl, cry. The nurse is fat and Mexican, has eaten too many tortillas. Nice to have met you, sweetheart, I tell her. Then I am back at the shack. I sit down and listen to the bathtub drip. I go over and pull all the blinds down and fall on the couch. All I can hear is tires on steel streets. There is a meow from the screen and I let him in, sober. Indifferent, hungry. We walk into the kitchen, male, swaggering under the electric light. Four balls, two heads, dominion over all the continent, over ships that sail in and out, over small female things and jewels. I get down the can of cat food and open it. Plato is left in the glove compartment. No Lady Godiva. She came to my place drunk, riding a deer up on the front porch. So many women want to save the world, but can't keep their own kitchen straight. But me... We went inside where I lit three red candles, poured the wine, and I took notes on her. Latitude behind, longitude in front, and the rest, amazing. A woman such as this could find a zinnia in Hot Springs, Arkansas. We ate venison for three weeks. Then she slept with the landlord to help pay the rent. Then I found her a job as a waitress. I slept all day, and when she came home, I was full of the brilliant conversation that she so much adored. She died quickly one night, leaving the world much the way it had been. Now, I get up early and go down to the loading docks and wait for cabbages, oranges, potatoes to fall from the trucks or to be thrown away. By noon I have eaten and am asleep, dreaming of paying the rent with numbered chunks of plastic, 
issued by a better world. Don't come round, but if you do, yeah, sure, I'll be in unless I'm out. Don't knock if the lights are out or you hear voices or then I might be reading Proust if someone slips Proust under my door or one of his bones for my stew. And I can't loan you money or the phone or what's left of the car, though you can have yesterday's newspaper, an old shirt or a bologna sandwich or sleep on the couch if you don't scream at night. And you can talk about yourself, that's only normal. Hard times are upon us all, only I'm not trying to raise a family to send through Harvard or buy hunting land. I'm not aiming high. I'm only trying to keep myself alive a little longer. So if you sometimes knock and I don't answer, and there isn't a woman in there, maybe I have a broken my jaw, you know, and I'm looking for wire, or I'm chasing the butterflies in my wallpaper. I mean, if I don't answer, I don't answer, and the reason is that I'm not yet ready to kill you, or love you, or even accept you. It means I don't want to talk, I am busy, I'm mad, I'm glad, or maybe I'm stringing up a rope. So even if the lights are on and you hear sound like breathing or praying or singing, a radio or the roll of dice or typing, go away. It is not the day, the night, the hour. It is not the ignorance of impoliteness. I wish to hurt nothing, not even a bug. But sometimes I gather evidence of a kind that takes some sorting. And your blue eyes, be they blue, and your hair, if you have some, or your mind, they cannot enter until the rope is cut or knotted, or until I have shaven into new mirrors, until the wound is stopped or opened forever. All right. Number six. I'll settle for the six horse on a rainy afternoon. A paper cup of coffee in my hand. A little way to go. The wind twirling out small wrens from the upper grandstand roof. The jocks coming out for a middle race, silent. And the easy rain making everything at once almost alike. The horses at peace with each other before the drunken war. And I'm under the grandstand, feeling for cigarettes, settling for coffee. Then the horses walk by, taking their little men away. It is funeral and graceful and glad, like the opening of flowers. There comes my landlord's car pulling up. Or is it going away? No, he's going out for more beer. Not for me, for his selfish little self. <laughs> okay. They, all of them, know. Ask the sidewalk painters of Paris. Ask the sunlight on a sleeping dog. Ask the three pigs. 
Ask the paper boy. Ask the music of Donizetti. Ask the barber. Ask the murderer. Ask the man leaning against a wall. Ask the preacher. Ask the maker of cabinets. Ask the pickpocket, or the pawnbroker, or the glassblower, or the seller of manure, or the dentist. Ask the revolutionist. Ask the man who sticks his head in the mouth of a lion. Ask the man who will release the next atom bomb. Ask the man who thinks he's Christ. Ask the bluebird who comes home at night. Ask the peeping Tom. Ask the man dying of cancer. Ask the man who needs a bath. Ask the man with one leg. Ask the blind. Ask, yes, ask the man with a lisp. Ask the opium eater. Ask the trembling surgeon. Ask the leaves you walk upon. Ask a rapist or a streetcar conductor and an old man pulling weeds in his garden. Ask a bloodsucker. Ask a trainer of fleas. Ask a man who eats fire. Ask the most miserable man you can find in his most miserable moment. Ask a teacher of judo. Ask a rider of elephants. Ask a leper, a lifer, a lunger. Ask a professor of history. Ask the man who never cleans his fingernails. Ask a clown or ask the first face you see in the light of day. Ask your father. Ask your son and his son-to-be. Ask me. Ask a burned out bulb in a paper sack. Ask the tempted, the damned, the foolish, the wise, the slavering. Ask the builders of temples. Ask the men who have never worn shoes. Ask Jesus. Ask the moon. Ask the shadows in the closet. Ask the moth, the monk, the madman. Ask the man who draws cartoons for the New Yorker. Ask a goldfish. Ask a fern shaping to a tap dance. Ask the map of India. Ask a kind face. Ask the man hiding under your bed. Ask the man you hate the most in this world. Ask the man who drank with Dylan Thomas. Ask the man who laced Jack Sharkey's gloves on. Ask the sad-faced man drinking coffee. Ask the plumber. Ask the man who dreams of ostriches every night. Ask the ticket taker at a freak show. Ask the counterfeiter. Ask the man sleeping in an alley under a sheet of paper. Ask the conquerors of nations and planets. Ask the man who has just cut off his finger. Ask a bookmark in the Bible. Ask the water dripping from a faucet while a phone rings. Ask perjury. Ask the deep blue paint. Ask the parachute jumper. Ah, ask the man with the bellyache. Ask the divine eyes so sleek and swimming. Ask the boy wearing tight pants in an expensive academy. Ask the man who slipped in the bathtub. Ask the man chewed by the shark. Ask the one who sold me the unmatched gloves. Ask these and those I've left out. Ask the fire, the fire, the fire. Ask even the liars. Ask anybody you please, any minute you please, on any day you please, whether it's raining or whether the snow is there, or whether you're stepping out onto a porch yellow with warm heat. Ask this, that, ask the man with bird shit in his hair, 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 hair. ask the torture of animals. Oh yes, ask the man who has seen many bullfights in Spain, ask the owners of new Cadillacs. Ask the famous, ask the timid, ask the albino and the statesman. 
Ask the landlords and the pool players. Ask the phonies. Ask the hired killers. Ask the bald men and the fat men and the tall men and the short men. Ask the one-eyed men, the oversexed and undersexed men. Ask the men who read all the newspaper editorials. Ask the men who breed roses. Ask the men who feel almost no pain. Ask the dying. Ask the mowers of lawns and the attenders of football games. Ask any of these or all of these. Ask, 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 and they'll all tell you. A snarling wife on the balustrade is more than a man can bear. The madman who lives in the court next to me has come home and he has his TV on blaring through my wall. It may cut through here a bit. Fine fellow. He's simply more insane than I am, definitely. The inside of it catches my heart in its hands. Flyleaf sort of poem. Small birds who go the way of cats sing on inside my head. The tragedy of the leaves. I awakened to dryness and the ferns were dead. The potted plants yellow as corn. My woman was gone and the empty bottles like bled corpses surrounded me with their uselessness. The sun was still good, though, and my landlady's note cracked in fine and undemanding yellowness. What was needed now was a good comedian, ancient style, a gesture with jokes upon absurd pain. Pain is absurd because it exists, nothing more. I shaved carefully with an old razor, the man who had once been young and said to have genius. But that's the tragedy of the leaves, the dead ferns, the dead plants. And I walked into the dark hall where the landlady stood, execrating and final, sending me to hell waving her fat, sweaty arms and screaming, screaming for the rent because the world had failed us both. You still there, Miles? All right. I cannot stand tears. There were several hundred fools around the goose who broke his leg, trying to decide what to do when the guard walked up and pulled out his cannon. And the issue was finished except for a woman who ran out of a hut, claiming he'd killed her pet. But the guard rubbed his straps and told her, kiss my ass, take it to the president. The bird was crying, and I cannot stand tears. I folded my canvas and went further down the road. The bastards had ruined my landscape. A real thing, a good woman. 
They are always writing about the bulls, the bullfighters, those who've never seen them. And as I break the webs of spiders reaching for my wine, the unhum of bombers, goddamn hum, breaking the solace. And I must write a letter to my priest about some third street whore who keeps calling me up at three in the morning. Up the old stairs, ass full of splendors, thinking of pocketbook poets and the priest. And I'm over the typewriter like a washing machine. And look, look, the bulls are still dying. And they are raising them, raising them like wheat in the fields. And the sun's black as ink, black ink that is. And my wife says, Brock, for Christ's sake, the typewriter all night, how can I sleep? And I crawl into bed and kiss her hair. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sometimes I get excited. I, I don't know why. A friend of mine <laughs> said he's going to write something about Manolette. Who's that? Nobody kid, somebody dead, like Chopin or our old mailman or a dog. Go to sleep, go to sleep. And I kiss her and rub her head, a good woman. And soon she sleeps and I wait for morning. Man in the Sun. She reads to me from the New Yorker, which I don't buy. Don't know how it got in here, but it's something about the Mafia. One of the heads of the Mafia who ate too much and had it too easy. Too many fine women patting his walnuts. And he got fat sucking at good cigars and young breasts, and he had these heart attacks. And so, one day somebody's driving him in this big car along the road, and he doesn't feel so good. And he asks the boy to stop and let him out. And the boy lays him out in the road in the sunshine. I don't know whether it's Crete or Sicily or Italy proper. But he's lying there in the sunshine. And before he dies, he says, How beautiful life can be. And then he's gone. Sometimes you've got to kill four or five thousand men before you somehow get to believe that the sparrow is immortal, money is piss, and that you've been wasting your time. I guess I've gotten very tired, Miles, but this is the last poem. Can we do it? Let's see it through. <laughs> We're hanging on the ropes, God. Round 15. Ah. Lift that left, left jab, keep the left high, cross with the right. Come on, baby, make it, make it. You can beat it, you can beat it. The bell will soon ring. Okay. 199 pounds of clay leaning forward. The chain is on the door. The naked women shut out. The naked power. As I blush before turbine-powered, sun-powered jets. Knowing that I'm not very good at going on, I'd rather watch a beetle crawl the sick powder dust of earth while you are aware of my cold handshake and my cigar more alive than my eyes, my wit will soon be dimmer than last fall sunlight. I'll surely die under the disordered match of some freak who loves flies. 
But Christ, friends, the luger, the mortar, the patchwork fitting as I gape out at you from a pork chop mouth. Take me as Caesar was taken, or Joan of Arc, or the men who fell off the fire escape drunk, or the suicided Bellevue, or Van Gogh confused with ravens and the atomic yellow. I hold everything away from myself so that you may become real and shaking and stemmed and ascending in blue and buttermilk as the chorus girls kick out, flags wave, their crotches stink. The eagle sinks into the sea, the ants take Notre Dame as our dirty time is just about served and done. Uh, it's been a long fight. So, sadness and beer and leaning towards sleep. <laughs>